The new Mitsubishi Outlander has landed here in Australia, boasting about 84 k's of electric only range from a 45% larger battery and now the option of seven seats in the upspec Exceed and Exceed Tourer grades. The catch? Well, it's a lot more expensive than the petrol car, $16,000 to be exact. So we're gonna be finding out in today's video whether it's worth the premium and whether you should be considering a plug-in hybrid as your next vehicle. Of course, I'd love to hear your comments and opinions down below, so leave them there and let's get into it. The variant behind me is the Aspire. It's sort of the mid-spec range, but it does get a lot of the features of the up-spec cars, including the 20-inch wheels. You can tell this car apart from its petrol-powered siblings by a slightly different grille, but that's pretty much it, apart from the absolutely mega plug-in hybrid badge down the side. But apart from that little bit of shouting, this car is actually pretty incognito with its eco credentials, but it does have some. So let's jump around the back and check out the vehicle to load capabilities that this car has on offer. Now under the power tailgate that's standard on this Aspire variant, we pop it open and we get to see the cool three pin socket that we've got in the back here. Of course, this Outlander isn't the only vehicle on sale that has a 240 volt three pin socket, but because you've got that extra battery size, you don't have to worry about your battery going flat while you're running appliances to boil water for a tea or even run a coffee machine as we were demonstrated the other day at the launch of this car. It's a pretty neat feature, but the Outlander also comes with a couple of other sort of fairly groundbreaking features in the vehicle to home and the vehicle to grid features that will begin rolling out. The idea being that you can use this car as effectively a portable battery in emergency situations using its 20 kilowatt hour battery to run your home or for example, run some hospital equipment in an emergency. Now, whether this will ever actually happen remains to be seen and I'd love to hear your thoughts down below, both on vehicle to load and vehicle to grid charging, but the fact that you can do that in a Mitsubishi Outlander is arguably pretty cool. Now back to the boring stuff of the boot, this five seat Aspire has 485 litres of cargo space in the seven seat Exceed and Exceed Tourers that falls a little bit with two rows to 478 litres, but that's much of a muchness. You also have a couple of other nice touches back here, plenty of storage under the floor to put your standardly included Mode 2 and Mode 3 charging cables. You've also got tabs to fold down the second row of seats really easily, so you don't have to reach in and hurt your back doing that. And the other great thing about this Aspire is the boot is pretty nicely fitted you've got lovely carpet and everything feels pretty high quality back here. We've spent a fair bit of time in Outlanders since this car's launch in 2021 here at Chasing Cars, but they've often been the high spec Exceed and the Exceed Tourer. So how does it hold up? Does it feel like a forgotten spec? Well, no, it's actually really nice in here. You don't get the leather seats of the Exceed, but you do get this sort of micro suede fabric and you still get three stage heating to keep you warm on a cold morning like this here in the Adelaide Hills. You also get the full technology package that those upmarket cars get. You get the nine inch touchscreen, which is crisp, responsive, and has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And you get a 12.3 inch digital driver's display that's customizable and actually looks pretty slick, though you can't show a full map in there, which is a bit unfortunate, but hey, it is a nicer thing to look at than a set of analog dials, in my opinion. You get a leather steering wheel as well, and it all just feels like this car is high quality. This leather appointed dashboard, nice and soft to the touch, and you get this really broad design element that feeds back into the exterior of this car. It looks attractive and it looks classy and expensive, not something you probably could have said about the last generation Outlander. The ergonomics too are pretty good. You've got a physical HVAC system down here. It's really easy to find the heated seats and adjust the temperature to your liking. You've got good shortcut buttons on the steering wheel and you've got a nice simple stack down here. The shifter takes a moment to get used to, but once you've got your head wrapped around it, it's all good. And you've got your drive mode selector down here as well. It feels pretty high quality. I will say though that the build of this Japanese built Outlander is a little bit cheap feeling. You can hear some creaks in the plastics as you go over bumps out on the road. I think that might be a little bit down to the fact that this car's 20 inch wheels do hurt its ride quality a little bit. Come back to that in a minute. And there are some elements that don't quite fit the design. For example, this door card up here does look, just this little element seems like it's from about a decade ago, but on the whole, the Outlander's cabin is really good. You even get electric adjustment for these seats and plenty of practical places to store water bottles, a wireless phone charger, USB-C and a USB-A port and a really generous centre bin under this armrest here. Being the Aspire means you can only get this car with five seats. Going up to the Exceed or the Exceed Tourer though, you do get the option of seven seats, and that's because the rear electric motor is 50% smaller than before, allowing easier packaging. 
but the electric gubbins do hurt the back seat's comfort a little bit because that 20 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery under the floor does mean that my legs are sort of dangling above the uh, under thigh support here. So it's not the most comfortable place for me at six foot two, but if you're a little bit shorter than me, it probably shouldn't be such an issue. Apart from the dangling, I do have a decent amount of leg room though, and toe room isn't bad, and headroom is very generous given this car's boxy and tall proportions. The comfort of the backrest is also pretty good, and you've got this nice micro suede material that continues use back here. You've also got two adjustable air vents, nice soft touch padding up here on the doors and a decent amount of practicality including these clever separated little uh, pockets in the back of the seat so you can have your phone or your tablet or your laptop and keep everything nice and neat and tidy in the back seat here. When it comes to the running costs of any plug-in hybrid, it's all about the diligence of the owner in making sure the car is charged and getting the most out of this kind of unique drivetrain system. But Mitsubishi says that Australian customers have been doing just that in the previous generation Outlander plug-in hybrid, with 84% of their 155Ks of weekly driving completed in electric mode. So obviously people are willing to take that jump and make sure they charge this car overnight. Speaking of charging, there are several ways to do it. You can do it on a three pin socket, takes about nine and a half hours. Moving up to a home wall box, that'll drop to six and a half hours. And this car has Chatamo DC fast charging capability at about 36 kilowatts for 38 minutes from a zero to 80% charge. Being a plug-in hybrid, you can also use that engine as a generator and that takes 94 minutes to get the car from naught to 80% state of charge. All pretty cool stuff. What does that mean for efficiency? Well, in official ADR testing, this car returned 1.5 liters per 100 kilometers. And of course, that's gonna vary very much depending on how much charge you have in this vehicle. As for when it's in electric mode only on the ADR cycle, the Outlander plug-in hybrid only recorded 25.7 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, which is pretty thirsty when compared to full EVs. However, of course, you have that backup from the petrol electric engine that can run as a generator in series mode or as a parallel when you go in a little bit more quickly. So what does all that charging torque mean? Well, it means after you've juiced this car up, it's 20 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery will take you about 84 kilometers in the real world on electric range. And you don't have to worry about range anxiety because you've got that petrol motor and a larger 56 liter fuel tank to get you a little bit further than the car it replaces. Mitsubishi also backs the Outlander with its same 10 year diamond guarantee. That's 10 years or 200,000 kilometers of warranty provided that you service this car at the dealership, which is gonna cost you $1,495 for the first five years or 75,000 Ks and needs to be done every 12 months or 15,000 Ks. As for insurance, the medium budget direct customer paid $917 to comprehensively insure their new Mitsubishi Outlander. Of course, your premium may vary based on things that insurers take into account, such as your driving history, where you live, and whether or not you garage the vehicle. A plug-in hybrid EV is a fairly complicated piece of kit. You've got multiple powertrain sources, multiple ways to charge it, and it's really down to the manufacturer into tuning how well all of those come together to make the most out of it. Now, Mitsubishi should have pretty good experience in this, given that the original Outlander plug-in hybrid was the first plug-in SUV ever on sale, and that launched in Australia in 2013. So best part of 10 years of experience uh, making and developing these cars before this one came along, and it does show this powertrain system is pretty refined. It combines two electric motors with a 2.4 litre petrol engine. So a four cylinder, it runs either in Atkinson cycle or auto cycle modes, depending on what it needs to be most efficient. So when you're giving it the berries, it does kick into, Aken, uh, into auto cycle mode to give it a little bit more power and efficiency in the higher RPMs. And it keeps it in an Atkinson cycle for when you're cruising around running in series or series parallel modes uh, around town. And that's pretty cool. So clever little bit of technology there. The 2.4 is a carryover engine as well. It's not the same as the 2.5 in the ICE car. Uh, it is a refined unit, but not making too much more power, four more kilowatts over the engine or the car that this thing replaces. Now, total outputs from all three engine sources are 185 kilowatts of power and a really respectable 450 newton meters of torque. That makes this car really quite rapid. Now you do need to fiddle around with the modes to make the most of the power though. So in normal mode uh, or in eco mode, you'll only be able to get a 10.2 second nought to 100 kilometer an hour sprint according to Mitsubishi's official figures. But if you ramp it up into sport or tarmac mode using this little drive select down here, um, which also changes the throttle response and the regen braking, which I'll come back to in a second, that drops the 0 to 100 time to 8.2 seconds. Now that's not as quick as something like a Volkswagen Tiguan 162 TSI 
Sight R-Line, but it is about the same sort of pace as a Toyota RAV4 Hybrid, if not slightly quicker. And the delivery of it is very seamless. You heard that then, you barely heard the petrol motor kick in. The refinement is excellent in this powertrain, and it certainly makes the Outlander feel a lot more refined in this petrol electric hybrid guys, rather than the standard petrol engine car. It's much smoother, much cleaner, and a lot more rewarding to drive as well. You don't have the flare of the revs as the gearbox goes through its ratios. Uh, speaking of the gearbox, this car actually has a single speed transaxle, a um, bit of a weird solution, but I guess that's the way it works with the plug-in electric um, powertrain, and it seems to work pretty seamlessly. It's not like a rubber bandy CVT, it sort of fades into the background. And so if you don't think about this engine and powertrain as a particularly performance oriented unit or as one that you sort of need to lay into the power of too much, it works really well. All-wheel drive on this car is standard as well from the base model all the way through and it works via two electric motors. So the front wheels can be powered by the petrol motor or an electric motor which now makes about 45% more power and there's also an electric motor in the rear and that gives this car its super all-wheel control, all-wheel drive system, that's what Mitsubishi calls it. And there's uh, active yaw control that works via braking on the rear axle now as well, where it used to be only on the front axle in the previous car. And what that means is this thing is really quite dynamic on the road. The weight distribution is definitely very different to the petrol car as well, and it lends this vehicle a slightly sharper front end and almost a more planted feeling to it. It is about, give or take a couple of kilos, 380 kilos heavier than the standard car to go to this electric vehicle, but that's obviously offset quite a long way by the amount of power, but you do feel it in the way this car goes around corners. The front end is light and the steering is quite artificial and light in this car. It doesn't inspire huge amounts of confidence or feel particularly sporty, but it does make the front end feel darty and that gives this car a little bit more of a feeling of responsiveness in twisty bends like we're on now out here in the Adelaide Hills. And it means that you can actually make pretty decent progress. It certainly feels a little bit more refined. You can feel the electric motors moving power between front and rear, sometimes giving you a little bit of understeer and sometimes a little bit of oversteer mid-corner. But ultimately, for a family car, this thing actually works really quite well. And now we come to the elephant in the room of the Mitsubishi Outlander, and that is this car's ride. Now, if you've seen Tom's launch review of this car or a review that Ponch has conducted on the Mitsubishi Outlander, then you'll know that one of our biggest problems with this family SUV is the fact that it doesn't ride that well, certainly in petrol form and especially on 20 inch alloy wheels. So this mid-spec Aspire we're testing has the larger of the two options, 20 inch alloy wheels shot in 255 45 series Bridgestone Ecopia tires. The tires themselves should be fairly compliant, but you still get that granular feedback from the 20 inch alloys. And sometimes when you hit a big pothole or some of the dirt roads that we tested this car on, that it actually did quite well on regarding its performance and its grip but when you come across some nasty corrugations you can feel those 20s kind of slap right into the bumps and it's not the most pleasant feeling in the world and I think that's where there's still a little bit of improvement to be done in the Outlander suspension tune. There's no Australian suspension tuning program for Mitsubishi, which is a bit of a shame given its historical roots in Australia, producing Magnas and 380s and developing them for our market. It's going to be really awesome to see as Mitsubishi gains a little bit more notoriety in Australia with head office, what happens to the Outlander in future updates. Because ultimately it doesn't ride badly, it's just that some of that sharp edged hit does make it through into the cabin quite aggressively. Perhaps the plug-in hybrid version is a little bit better. It does ride on completely different suspension tune to the regular car. Obviously, it's a hell of a lot heavier and the weight distribution is all different, but it's still not perfect. And the other thing about the Outlander is there's just that little bit of head toss, that suspension kind of moving laterally around on the body that does make you feel a little bit seasick. Not so much when you're driving, but I did spend a good hour and a half passengering in this car yesterday, which you don't always get to do. Um, and that just slight rocking motion a little bit of lack of body control does make it feel a little bit seasick. But ultimately, around town, I've got to say, it is pretty plush. It definitely errs on the side of plushness, save for that secondary ride from the wheels and tyres. The primary ride is comfortable and pretty gorgeous, actually. And on the 18-inch wheel base model, that means the ride is definitely better but it's something that could be improved over time, and I'm sure we'll see that happen shortly. I'd love to hear your thoughts, though. If you've bought an Outlander and you can feel the same thing, or not, let me know down below. Now let's get on to safety as well, because the Outlander is really well equipped here in Australia, across the range. 
every variant on sale gets the full complement of five stars from ANCAP safety testing. That means you've got front AAB with pedestrian, cyclist and junction detection. You move up the range, you get a couple of other niceties, but lane keep assist is standard. This vehicle gets blind spot monitoring thrown in as well as things such as a 360 degree camera. And you get that from this Aspire upwards through Exceed and Exceed Tourer. And for me, what that means is that the Aspire is actually the best buy in the range because apart from leather seats, you kind of get everything. Yes, you've got the bigger 20 inch wheels, but you get that across the range pretty much. So if you're a private buyer, the Aspire feels like a really full specification and it means you don't need to spend nearly $70,000 on going for something like the XE Tourer that is the range topper that gets stuff like massage seats. For me, I think the Aspire strikes a real sweet spot for a private buyer who's after something a little bit nice but doesn't want to break the bank and wants to move into the sphere of electrification but without the range anxiety concerns associated with buying a full battery EV, which you could do for not a whole lot more money. But as we said, it's a very different kettle of fish when it comes to driving this car, planning your life and running a vehicle like this. The plug-in hybrid kind of works seamlessly in everyday life without having to think too much about it. But to get the most out of it, you've got to charge it just right to get all of the maximum benefit you can from a plug-in hybrid system. It's not going to work for everyone, but I do think it's great to have another plug-in hybrid option from Mitsubishi, and one that is as refined and reasonably well finished as this thing is. I've got to talk a little bit about regen braking as well, because the latest Outlander is a lot better and there's a lot more options than the vehicle it replaces. Mitsubishi says the regen maximum force has gone up from 0.1G to 0.2G, so effectively doubling. And that means you can almost get around driving in one pedal mode by pressing this little uh, eye pedal button down here. So that gives you a lot more regen. The other option is to adjust it through the paddles in normal drive mode. Um, and yeah, it gives a lot of different options. So if you do like one pedal driving like I've come to, it does a good job. You can't really bring this car to a full stop every time. So sometimes you've got to plan ahead quite a long way for a set of red traffic lights, especially coming up down a hill, or just apply a little bit of brake. So it's not quite as powerful as, say, a system you'd find in a Polestar 2 or a Tesla Model Y. However, it does actually work really well, and I think it's going to be great for people who are not quite used to that one pedal mode. You can work up to it through the various levels of regen braking adjustable via the paddles behind the steering wheel. And then when you're confident, you can go full into one pedal mode by pressing that button down there. The new Outlander plug-in hybrid may be more expensive than the vehicle it replaces, but that longer all-electric range, the added practicality of being able to fit seven seats in this car, all add up to a vehicle that just feels so much more complete. Add to that the new interior that features across the whole Outlander range, and yes, it's a really interesting option. Is it worth the money that it's charging? That's going to be up to you and whether or not you can make the plug-in hybrid system work for you to save money on fuel. And the other thing is that I still think there's some final tuning to be done on the suspension perhaps in a facelift or a midlife update to make this car really work on Australia's tough and testing backroads. But still, it is a worthy option and the fact that you've got all that electric only range in this plug-in hybrid model seems pretty interesting to me. But of course, I'd love to hear your opinions on the new Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. Is it something you consider? Let me know down below. And while you're there leaving your opinion, why not hit subscribe to Chasing Cars if you haven't done so already? And as always, thank you very much for watching.